Life is witnessed. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. And this is Quick Study Weekend Edition. Thank you for joining us and being a part of the program today as we continue going through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, 66 books. And we are coming up on Revelation very soon. Now today we talk about this. The truth is, in this gospel message, life is witnessed. And we'll talk about that from 1 John. It's going to be a great day. So stay there with us as we continue to study on. Corey, what are you doing today? Today we're going to be talking about some of the biological relatives of Jesus Christ through Mary. Very good. Excellent. Ryan, what are you doing today? Well, guys, it's the end of the year, and so we're at the end of our interviews with astronomer Dr. Danny Faulkner. But before he goes, I ask him one final question actually for some advice for creationists who are thinking about entering academia. Very interesting. And that, that can be a challenge for some Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Because they think it's, you know, it's only going to be, you know, the, the scientists don't allow. Persecution. And, the, because yes. of the persecution and everything. A very interesting day. Okay, we've studied a lot and we've got a lot prepared for you. So get your Bible guide out and get your Bible out as we continue to study through the Bible. Here comes Corey. It's not very often that we think of the Roman official response to the resurrection and the death of Jesus Christ. We often think about the theological implications, but there must have been social implications as well. Check this out. As an event that would shake the entire world, influencing the tide of history so continuously, no incident can stand against the resurrection of Jesus Christ. According to the Gospel of Matthew, people began right away trying to explain the miraculous. The Pharisees paid Roman guards to say Jesus' body had been stolen from his sealed tomb, without the guards seeing or following. Though this bribed invention didn't do much to stop the spread of Christianity, archaeology has revealed that it likely influenced the ear of the Emperor of Rome. Known since 1878, an intriguing artifact named the Nazareth Inscription may shed light on the official Roman response to Jesus' resurrection. As its name suggests, it came from the city of Nazareth and is strongly believed to be an authentic inscription from the first century. The inscription opens as an abridged version of an official decree from Rome. It's concerned with the stealing of entombed bodies. What makes this unusual is that this isn't grave robbing. No valuables are being taken, only bodies. It also appears that this decree is aimed specifically at Jewish and Christian Jewish lifestyle who commonly use the family tomb. The inscription also links the offense of stealing a body with an evil plan, a deviously thought out calculated offense. And the punishment is very severe, brought before a religious tribunal, and if found guilty, capital punishment. This inscription, dated to before AD 70, fits the time frame, the content, and even the culture that was reeling in the aftermath of Jesus' resurrection. It was a dangerous belief, replacing the king of Rome with the king of heaven in a time period of revolt. It appears that Rome's response was to place a decree in the very spot this leader was said to have come from, a place that even identified these Christians called Nazarenes. The stone was placed in Nazareth. It's interesting, isn't it? This inscription that may have come from Nazareth. It's a very intriguing concept. Now, we also know that there would have been official records of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ filed by Pontius Pilate. Now, evidence for that comes in a secondary source when we're looking at Roman historians such as Tacitus and Josephus, who mention uh, Jesus being crucified during the reign of Tiberius on the order of the governor of Judea, which was Pontius Pilate. Now, these men were writing decades after uh, the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and they were writing officially for Rome and for the emperors of Rome. So where would they have gotten that information? It wasn't within uh, their educational lifespan. So where would they have gotten it? Well, from the records that Pontius Pilate would have filed in Rome. So at that point, when Tacitus and Josephus were writing, uh, it's very... Uh, 
uh, plausible and probable that they had access to the original records filed in Rome about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So very neat things that we don't often think about historically, uh, but when you put all the evidence together and you look at history as a big picture and the New Testament as a big picture, you can see all those fine uh, pieces in there. Now, a little bit later on in the program, we're going to be talking about the relatives of Jesus Christ through his biological mother, Mary. So stick around for that. It's going to be interesting. There are false teachers within the church desiring to take control. They make lots of money by speaking nicely or using extreme speech, but not the Word of God. This is the focus of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Our study today is in 1st John. Foundational principles in the first part of this book set up the rest of it. Now we must be aware that there are many who are teaching something other than the Word of God or teaching a partial truth in the name of the Word of God. We must always listen, consider, and ask, is what is being taught the whole Word of God? Well, the Quick Study program is about the Bible, and I encourage you to keep tabs on us and keep the Bible, the whole Word of God, in clear view while you're watching. First John 1, verses 1 through 9. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him, and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. First, second, and third John. These are three books of the Bible that are very short and they're very interesting. And we're going to focus on them on this day and we're going to look at what God is saying to us. This is interesting. First John is the one that we'll look at. Now remember, we have a Bible guide that has four points covering today's study and a lot of other things too. And if you don't have your Bible guide, why not write to us and ask for it because we've got a new Bible guide coming next year. I'm very excited about that, you know. That new Bible guide is going to be great. And it's every year it's all new material. I'm very excited, so you can tell. Anyway, so make sure that you send an offering in any amount, and we'll make sure that we send you the pocket guide. You can also call us too, by the way. But our look here is in, in the review is wisdom in the Word. The Word of God. Wisdom, divine thinking in the Word of God. That's amazing. And our reading is 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 
Well, our focus is on 1 John chapters 1 through 9. Now, Janice has already read to you what we're going to be studying today. We're going to take three of those points and look at them very carefully because God is saying something to us that we need to hear. So we go into the scripture, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Now, 1 John, John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifest, made known, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest, made known to us that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that you may, that your joy rather may be full. Now this is amazing, because we look at this and we see John says they witnessed the life, the death, and the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. It is true and recorded in the Gospels. John explains here, he says, now listen, we are the ones who saw this life. We are the ones who witnessed what happened and we've written it in the Gospels and you need to remember that. You need to understand that. So John in the first part of his book says, understand this, the story's true and it's real. I find that fascinating because John writes here at a time when uh, it's a little bit past the Gospels. And so we need to understand and hear what God is saying. And this apostle is one of the people who understood that and saw it. So it's very important. We get it. We get it, Lord. Yes, the story's true. Okay, Lord, we've got it. Now let's go back to the next passage and we learn something. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 to 7 say, This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in the darkness, we lie. And we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is very important because you need to understand this for communion. John claims that walking in the light is following Jesus Christ. Beloved, we must be truthful for the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us. What does that mean? It simply means that when we come to Jesus Christ and when we look at communion in our churches, let's assume we're going to churches, which we should. We should go to a church just to prove that, uh, that we can exist and, and be a part of the church because we're going to live forever with each other in eternity. So we should really get in connection with each other, shouldn't we? So we shouldn't just hibernate off on our own. We should understand that there comes a point when we need to learn how to be together. And when we come to church and we take the communion, we understand that we need to examine ourselves before and say, Lord, cleanse me from my sin and from my bad decisions with the blood of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean give me salvation. Now you can do that, but that doesn't mean that. For the believer, it means, Lord, help me to restore myself to you. That's very important. So we do that and we say, okay, Jesus, help me to, help me to be right and restore myself to you. And then we are ready to take the communion and understand exactly what God is doing. That is very important. Well, we go on to 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Now listen to this verse. This is important. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. That brings us to the next point, which is very important. John proclaims if we say we are sinless, we are in darkness and there is no truth in us. Now, I want to say that because it's important for you and I and everybody to realize what we're actually saying. We're not saying that we have not been forgiven, and we're not saying that we're not saved, but we are saying that our tendencies and our realities upon this earth 
force us because we're under the sin curse to work towards a better life. And the better life does not happen now. The better life happens when we get to heaven. But we need to realize and understand that we are sinners. Now, some people, they're going to, you know, they're going to go, oh, I'm a sinner. I'm a... Well, you know, you got to be careful with this because you need to be honest with the Lord and say, Lord, I don't believe that I'm right. I believe that when Adam sinned and Eve sinned back at the beginning, that everything started a downward fall. And I'm in the midst of that fall right now, but I am working my life to make it more like you and your word is helping me. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to say. We need to work our way and say, Jesus Christ, help me to work my way back to you and back to the state of sinlessness. Now, as promised earlier on in the program, you and I are going to be taking a look at the family of Jesus Christ here. Now, this is the biological relatives of Jesus Christ through his mother, Mary. The Gospels say that Mary had children with Joseph after Jesus was born. So let's take a look at some Christian history here. The New Testament of the Bible is largely quiet on the partial relatives of Jesus Christ through Mary and Joseph. It is recorded that John the Baptist was Jesus' relative through their mothers, and that Jesus had half-brothers and sisters by Mary and Joseph. According to Acts and early Christian history, Jesus' brothers turned from disbelief to belief in him as the Son of God after his resurrection. These men presumably married and had children. While exhaustive accounts of their lives are not possible, there are fragments of traditions recorded in early church history. In the works of 4th century AD historian Eusebius, these accounts are gathered together. He tells us of the life of James, brother of Jesus, as the first bishop of the Jerusalem Christians. For the appointing of the second bishop, he says this, those of the apostles and disciples of the Lord who were still alive gathered from everywhere with those who were, humanly speaking, relatives of the Lord. They all discussed who ought to succeed James, and all unanimously decided on Simeon, son of Clopas, first cousin of the Savior. Eusebius goes on to tell of Simeon's later martyrdom by days-long torture and final crucifixion, but he still fills us in on what he knows of those relatives of Jesus. During the reign of Emperor Domitian, harsh policies against Christianity were passed that saw executions and banishments, including the banishment of the surviving Apostle John. History also records that Domitian was annoyed by the idea of a prophesied Jewish Messiah. The great nephews of Jesus, physically belonging to the bloodline of David, were rounded up and questioned. When Domitian realized they were poor and their beliefs in a Messiah were heavenly, he let them go, thinking them trivial. Yet it was these lowly relatives that would become embedded and dedicated servants of the church. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television as we go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in one year. We are excited because we're getting ready to get into the end of the Bible very soon. But listen, on the next program of Quick Study Television, here's what I'm talking about. Heaven reports the door is open for people to see. See what? To see heaven. And we'll talk about that and more next time on Quick Study Television. Ryan, what are you talking about? Well, in this last interview with Dr. Danny Faulkner, I asked him to give us his advice to creationists who are thinking about entering academia but are afraid of persecution from the evolutionists. Now, Dr. Danny taught in a secular university for many years and so is more than qualified to give advice on this issue. Okay, what kind of advice would I give to young people uh, who are entering the field who are creationists but yet are fearful of persecution from the anti-creationists, the evolutionists, the atheists out there? 
I would, I would advise several things to students coming through the system looking to serve the Lord as, as creation scientists. Uh, first of all, I would su suggest you need to pray. You need to ask for wisdom. You need to ask for the Lord's protection in all that you do. And when you go out, you should go to a school where you think that you can be f uh, firmly grounded. I myself went to uh, Bob Jones University, a, a Christian university, where I got a f very thorough grounding uh, in creation. Um, that's a good place to start, I do believe, at a place like that. Um, if you don't go that route, you better be uh, firmly planted because uh, you're going to, from the very beginning in your undergraduate days, you're going to get a lot of teachings that are contrary to what Scripture says. And so you need to uh, use resources of many uh, Christian authors out there, videos, books, the whole bit, and, and go to the creation organizations looking for resources to help you because when you're taught something that looks pretty clear to, to teach evolution uh, in, in your classrooms, you have to realize that there's probably a, a rebuttal or refutation out there in the creation literature. You need to be able to find that so that you won't be lost. I've known young people who have been lost along the way because their, their heads were turned by this. As you go on through college and graduate school, you need to also kind of keep a low profile or at least have the wisdom to know where and when and how you ought to speak. There are some people who have been outspoken throughout their um, school careers. Uh, others uh, were not so outspoken. I wasn't. I didn't run away from a fight or an argument or a discussion, but uh, neither did I try to look for one. I, I figured if, if, uh, if they wanted to talk to me about it and debate this, I'd be happy to, but I wasn't going to initiate the discussion. It wasn't my place. I was there to learn and uh, learn about the evolutionary model. It's very important sometimes just to keep your mouth shut and learn all that you can. Um, that's what I did. Uh, now that i am in been for 25 years in uh, professorial rank, uh, I'm more outspoken. It's no secret uh, who and what I am. My university has been very supportive. Uh, some people watch the Expelled movie with Ben Stein. I've watched it many times. And you see some real horror stories there, but not all places are like that and not all experiences are like that. I'm happy to report that academic freedom truly is alive and well at the University of South Carolina. I've had uh, several people try it from outside the university, outside of the state and the nation even, attempt to uh, get me in trouble with the university. And it hasn't worked uh, because they respect me for the work I do. I do a good job in the classroom. I do a good job with uh, committee and other work that I do for the campus and the university. And that's important. Uh, it, it maintains a Christian testimony showing you to be a person of integrity and, and, and uh, someone worthy of being called named Christian. And uh, if all you are is a creationist, that's all they know you as, then you're probably headed for trouble. You need to objectively work on your job, make sure you do the best job you can, whatever you're asked to do. I'd like to thank Dr. Danny for taking the time out of his very busy schedule to talk with us. Now, I highly recommend you check out his work. And to do so, you'll have to head over to the Answers in Genesis website at answersingenesis.org. There you'll find a couple of books he's written, including this one called Universe by Design. Also, you'll find thousands of articles and other resources written on the whole topic of creation and evolution. It's a great website that I use all the time. Again, it's AnswersInGenesis.org. And that's AnswersInGenesis.org. Thank you for that great report, Ryan. That is excellent. Danny Faulkner is a great guy. And mm -hmm. uh, he comes up and we do work with him when they do the creation event. The creation conference. Yeah, yes, creation conference, conference. Every once in a while. It's great. We met we go, him there. go up to a camp and we, you know, it's sweaty and it's hot and it's August, but it's great. <laughs> All the, uh, the scientists are there and everything. Listen, I need to tell the people that we are doing a new Bible guide. We are. Starts it, again in January. And we're going to finish the whole Bible again. We're doing it again. This time we're going to focus on the fundamental theology. So the theology that basically we need to understand is the Bible theology that Christians believe. Mm -hmm. So if you read the Bible and if you give your life to Jesus Christ and you're a practicing Christian, a believer who's practicing these things, what is it you're practicing? Because a lot of people don't know. And you know what's great about foundational theology is that it can be extremely deep and it can it can really uh, grow in your mind and in your heart or it can be shallow if you're just a beginner. It can be it, it can be easy to understand and it, at the same time incredibly deep. So it's I'm really excited for next year. It is important also to know that Israel is a nation that shares space with the church. Mm -hmm. This has happened recently since 1948, and it's very interesting because there are times when things are happening with Israel, and you say, wait a minute, that's, that's incredible. That's what we read in Ezekiel, and it's true. 
And so we're going to be highlighting a lot of that as we go through the year and looking at some of the other things that come up. So I'm looking forward to next year. It's all new material. Now, if you want to get the Bible guide, if you have not been part of our uh, membership and you want to do that, it's very simple. We do not ask for a lot of money. We simply ask you give what you can and we'll send you the Bible guide. It's very important. Or you can give online. Here is the address, P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania. That's 15668150. That's P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668150. Now in Canada or the rest of the world, if you're writing from the UK or you're writing from Australia or you're writing from somewhere other than North America, you can use this address. P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. That's the address you want to use. But remember, you can also use the internet. We are available to most of the world, www.biblediscoverytv.com, www.biblediscoverytv.com. That's very important. Go there and check it out. The truth of salvation of God is that we're not right in any sense. There is nothing in this world or of this world that can make us right before God, except forgiveness by the blood of Jesus Christ as we confess our sins to Him. We do not confess our sins to anyone except the living Lord Jesus Christ. This is the gospel or the good news of the Lord. We must keep this forefront as we move forward in our faith. Well, the truth is that the Lord Jesus Christ came when he came 2,000 years ago. He didn't do anything wrong, but he was just living and explaining to us how God desires us to be. And we got a hold of him and we accused him of everything. And it wasn't his sin, it was our sin. The devil manipulated us. We crucified him and killed him. But then on the third day, he rose again. He came to life and he said, come to me, all you are heavy laden. I will give you rest.